Hi, a lot of my friends and students have been asking me to uh, give my opinions on Trotskyism. So I thought I'd make this short video to explain why I am not a Trotskyist. When I was in my late teens, I didn't know much about uh, socialist politics, but I did know that I didn't support capitalism. And my opinions about what happened or transpired in the Soviet Union uh, were mainly formed by the mainstream media. I hadn't read up on it in, at any uh, great length or detail. And much like a lot of other people, I thought that uh, Trotsky was a highly intelligent uh, political leader and would have probably, uh, had he become the leader of the Soviet Union after Lenin, then uh, I thought at the time that the Soviet Union may have survived. When I went to the United States to study, uh, you know, st to do my undergraduate degree, I came across a party called the Socialist Workers Party USA. This was in the mid-90s, 1994, and I joined that party, and that is a Trotskyist party, and I was with that party for a number of years. And so becoming familiar with that party allowed me to read up on the literature of the Pathfinder Press, but also uh, I read up on Trotsky, I read on Lenin, I read uh, on Marx, obviously, and so on. So I read in a lot of detail. So my opinions about Trotsky were not formed by any interaction with uh, any political party that was non-Trotskyist or anything of that sort. They were formed mainly by my own interaction with Trotskyist literature of the Socialist Workers Party U uh, US to begin with and then with the broader Trotskyist literature and then also uh, my my reading of uh, uh, Trotsky himself. I subsequently went on to join the Workers World Party of Sam Marcy which I found to be uh, much better on the question of uh, uh, th uh, support for third world revolutions and so on. So um, let me now tell you what my reasons for rejecting Trotskyism are. So before I begin, uh, this is a very big subject and it's difficult to approach it, uh, you know, so I have to define how I'm going to approach this particular question. So I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of the history of uh, the role of Trotsky or the role of Lenin or the role of Stalin in the Soviet Union because we can go on and on with respect to that for hours on end and that will require a very, very lengthy video. And uh, in any case, uh, you know, we can't step back into the past to change that history. All we can do is learn from that history to guide us in the present. So what is it that Trotskyism suggests? Out of all of that history, what conclusions does Trotskyism come to to guide our struggle today? That is the most pertinent question. Since we cannot change the past and we are mostly concerned with the present and with the future, we look to the past to guide us in the present to build a new future. So what does Trotskyism represent? That is the main question. So what I'm going to try and do is examine what is called the theory of permanent revolution, which is the centerpiece of Trotsky's, Trotsky's theory and the centerpiece of Trotskyism as a whole, uh, whatever um, you know, denomination of Trotskyism we may be talking about. Or not denomination, but whatever group, whatever um, kind of Trotskyism we may be talking about. So what is uh, the theory of permanent revolution? It consists of three central ideas. And I think most Trotskyists will agree when I characterize it in this particular way. The first is a criticism of what is called the two-stage theory of revolution. The two-stage two theory of revolution is essentially that uh, after feudalism there will be a long stage of capitalist development and only after a long stage of capitalist development can there be a socialist revolution and therefore uh, you know, certain Marxists think that certain countries are not yet ready for socialism and need to, for the moment, just stick with uh, a democratic form of capitalism till a later point in time when socialism can come on the historical agenda. The second criticism is the criticism of socialism in one country. According to Trotsky, it's the idea that you can construct a socialist society in a situation where imperialism or where the vast majority of the world remains capitalist is next to impossible. What will happen in that, what is likely to happen in that country is that the revolution will become bureaucratized. Uh, it will become a Stalinist uh, sort of deviation. It will become dictatorial. And uh, this will be a very, very negative development for for socialism. And last but certainly not least, perhaps I should have mentioned it first, uh, Trotskyism is opposition to what they call Stalinism, which is basically uh, the way they understand it, uh, a, bureauc a class of bureaucrats that has um, uh, lodged itself over and above the working class, not just in the former Soviet Union, 
but in all parts of the world. And this class of Stalinist bureaucrats that is at the top of the, of the hierarchy of the working class movement is preventing the working class from achieving political power. So those three ideas, what were they again? The two-stage theory, criticism of the two-stage theory of revolution, criticism of socialism in one country, and criticism of Stalinism sum up what Trotskyism represents today and sum up the theory that guides Trotsky's parties in the world today. How did Trotsky arrive at these particular conclusions? What were the debates surrounding these ideas? That's what I want to get into. Now, when Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, he said very clearly that the theory of the communists may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. That's from the Communist Manifesto. And uh, the same manifesto continues. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. So it was very clear that in the context of a society where the proletariat becomes a large class, it becomes a majority class, it becomes the people that uh, the proletariat taking power will be a democratic revolution. It will change you know, that, those societies and it will change the mode of production. But what about societies where the proletariat was not the majority. In other words, what about societies where there was either no capitalism or there was a little bit of capitalism, but it wasn't sufficient such that the proletariat was the majority of the population. Wherever the proletariat is not the majority of the population, the class that is the majority is obviously the peasantry. So what role do the peasants play in the context of socialism? Well, Marx and Engels had the experience of the French Revolution uh, you know, in their historical uh, rare view mirror. And in the French Revolution, when examining the French Revolution, they came to, to the conclusion that the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte represented the class interests of the peasants. So, for example, Karl Marx writes in the class struggles in France, he writes, Napoleon was the only man who had exhaustively represented the interests and imagination of the peasants class, newly created in 1789. And similarly, in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, Marx writes, Bonaparte represents a class indeed. He represents the most numerous class of French society, the small peasant proprietor. So it's very clear, I think, from here that uh, for Marx and Engels, the peasant proprietor was, uh, was, was not revolutionary. Uh, in fact, to some extent, Marx and Engels even thought that the peasant proprietor was reactionary. So in the Communist Manifesto, Marx say this very explicitly. They say the lower middle class, the small manufacturer, the shopkeeper, the artisan, the peasant, all these fight against the bourgeoisie to save from extinction their existence as fractions of the middle class. They are therefore not revolutionary but conservative, for they try to roll back the wheel of history. As you can see from this, the peasant class was considered by Marx to be a sort of middle strata, middle layer that was conservative and that could even be reactionary. Now, when Marxism was translated and became, you know, an intellectual current amongst a lot of young revolutionaries in Russia, they had to grapple with uh, a society, applying Marxism to a society where the proletariat was a relatively small class, only about two million people, and the peasantry was a vast class, numbering in a, over a hundred million people. So how was a small class of people, a couple of million, going to sort of uh, uh, dominate over or rule over or convert a society of over a hundred million peasants into a socialist society? That was the main question in front of the uh, Russian Marxists. The other que interesting question in front of them was the idea, the revolutionary theory that existed before Marxism became a popular theory in Russia, and that theory was known as Narodnism, we translate that as populism. Narodnism was a very powerful revolutionary idea, and the central idea of that the, uh, of that uh, ideology was that in Russia, the peasant, uh, a peasant revolution will help to skip the stage of capitalism altogether. In other words, Russia does not have to enter a capitalist stage and then become socialist. A peasant revolution will directly jump over capitalism directly into socialism. That was the Narodnik theory. Now, and you know, a whole generation of urban young revolutionaries went to the villages to organize the peasants. But uh, sadly, the Russian mujik, the peasant, uh, you know, didn't 
support the young Narodniks at first, certainly, and in many instances, even handed over these young peasant urban, sorry, these young intellectual urban revolutionaries to the government, uh, where they got caught, etc. When this began to happen and Narodnism failed to move the peasant masses in the way that they hoped or expected, uh, they then began, they, then they constructed another theory, which was a sort of a theory of heroism, which is that individuals must do acts of great heroism to rouse the peasant masses to political action. These things, uh, these acts of heroism included things like assassination, they could include things like uh, sabotage and so on and so forth. These were sort of violent sort of tactics. And Lenin's elder brother, in fact, Alexander, whom Lenin called Sasha, also, uh, you know, was implicated in such a case of trying to assassinate uh, uh, public officials and was, in fact, hanged to death. He was also a Narodnik. So this is the context in which Russian, in which Marxism moves from Europe to Russia. And the person who moved Marxism really from Europe to Russia is, is a man named uh, Georgi Plekhanov. Now, Plekhanov established uh, the hegemony of Marxism, the hegemony of Marxism in revolutionary circles in opposition to the Narodnik theory that the peasants were the most revolutionary class and the Narodnik theory that uh, Russia could skip over the capitalist stage of development and also the Narodnik theory of heroism and, uh, you know, excitative terrorism, etc. So he introduced the idea, uh, Plekhanov introduced the idea that the industrial workers were the most revolutionary class, uh, in fact, were the only really revolutionary class in Russia, and that young people, instead of going to villages, ought to go to factories and organize, uh, you know, working uh, industrial workers. At the same time, uh, many people in the Russian movement thought that peasants were essentially reactionary, they would not support such a revolution, and... Um, in any case, peasant, the main aim of the peasant class was to uh, uh, break up the big massive feudal estates, but to inherit the parts of those feudal estates as their own small peasant private property. In other words, to break up the feudal estates and to become peasant proprietors themselves. Peasant proprietors obviously are, um, you know, are owners of property, but the whole purpose of the Marxist revolution was to undo property. Hence, in that framework, they, they, many Mensheviks, uh, for example, are thought that the peasants were revolutionary. Um, so, uh, uh, Plekhanov introduced the idea that Russia cannot jump over the stage of capitalism. That is ahistorical, undialectical, and absolutely absurd. You require a proletariat to move into socialism. The peasant class cannot move into socialism by virtue of the fact that the peasant class it mainly aims to become a small proprietor, not to f abolish or eliminate private property altogether. Hence, many Mensheviks thought that Russia must undergo further capitalist development in order for the stage to develop where socialism would be possible. The, the workers must therefore demand mainly uh, the abdication, the, the elimination of Tsarism. They must work with the other bourgeois parties, the capitalist, pro-capitalist parties. They must not try to undo capitalism in and of itself, but must aim their main guns against the aristocracy, against, against Tsarism, must eliminate that Tsarist government and create a democratic republic. That was sort of the main the main mission. And then capitalist development would, would occur, creating a larger and larger proletariat. And once the proletariat war became the majority, then it would be possible for Russia to move into the socialist stage. Individual Mensheviks may not have agreed with one or another aspect of this theory, but that was in a nutshell you know, sort of the division between the Mensheviks on the one hand, mainly led by Georgi Plekhanov, although on ma in many instances he also disagreed with his own faction. And on the other hand were, were the Bolsheviks. Bolshevik means, of course, majority. Menshevik means minority. I think most people know that. So what was Lenin's main thesis that separated him from and his followers from the Mensheviks? His main thesis were that although peasants were not socialist, 
they were nonetheless revolutionary in the bourgeois democratic sense, in the sense that they were opposed to the large feudalist states, they were opposed to feudalism. And on that basis, he concluded that a worker-peasant alliance was not only possible, but would be sufficient to proceed, uh, not just to eliminate the, the, uh, the, the aristocracy, the czarist aristocracy, but would be sufficient to proceed to socialism. This is one of the key differences between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. So now, um, in, Lenin is proposing that instead of a proletariat alliance with the bourgeoisie against the aristocracy, the proletariat should ally itself uh, with the peasants. There should be a worker-peasant alliance against, first and foremost, the aristocracy, uh, against uh, feudalism, and then secondly, also against capitalism. So now you see one of the big differences between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks is basically driven by the peasant question. Whether the peasants are, if, if you believe that the peasants are reactionary, then obviously the proletariat is not uh, present in sufficient quantity to create a proletarian revolution in Russia and you would have to work with some form of capitalism but if the peasants may not be socialist because they are you know really breaking up large estates to become peasant proprietors but they are still revolutionary in the bourgeois democratic sense and are willing to accept the leadership of the industrial working class which wants to undo property altogether then you have the firm social foundation for a uh, for a uh, for a for a socialist republic now, in the middle of this fight between these two big factions um, was someone, uh, was basically Trotsky, who you can consider a rogue Menshevik, because he agreed with some aspects of Menshevism, but disagreed with other aspects of Menshevism. And by the way, I think, you know, on the whole, these factions tended to move around a bit. Individuals moved around, you know, on these factions, although the positions of these factions remain more or less quite steady. So Trotsky was part of the Menshevik faction. He opposed Lenin, etc. And the basis of his disagreement with Lenin was firstly that he agreed that the peasants were indeed reactionary. He thought that was that the Menshevik idea, the essential idea that the peasants were not revolutionary but were conservative and reactionary was correct. But you Trotsky presented a unique solution out of this situation. He did not present the typical Menshevik solution, which was that the proletariat should make an alliance with the young and upcoming bourgeoisie to create a democratic republic. Rather, he thought that the proletariat should forget about, uh, you know, the peasantry because because that's reactionary. It should equally forget about the liberal or the or, or the or, you know the sort of uh, bourgeoisie or even the revolutionary bourgeoisie. It should make the revolution despite the fact that the peasantry, sorry, that the proletariat is a small minority because, and this is the key, sooner or later, a European socialist revolution will also arise and will rescue the Russian revolution. The European proletariat, given that it is a majority in Germany and in the large sort of industrially developed societies, will come to power more or, you know, more or less with the, uh, with the re European wide sort of revolution in which the Russian working class would also take power and, you know, the European working class would take power in their respective countries. And then the European working class will be able to give the assistance to the Russian working class in such a way that despite the fact that the Russian working class is a minority in comparison to the large peasant class, the revolution, the Russian revolution will be saved. This is what he referred to as the theory of permanent revolution. And this is why he emphasized and again, again and again the importance of the quote unquote international revolution and what he what he calls what Trotskyites often call internationalism. So what would happen to a revolution that, let's say, took power in a relatively backward society um, uh, like Russia, where the proletariat was a minority and the peasant class was a vast majority? What would happen to such a revolution in the absence of a revolution, let's say, in Europe? What, well, Trotsky gives his answer. He says, if the proletariat were to make a revolution in, let's say, Russia, he says, in this, it, the proletariat would come into hostile collision, not only with all the bourgeois groupings which support the proletariat during the first stages of its revolutionary struggle, but also with the broad masses of the peasantry with whose assistance it came into power. So, you understand here that if the Russian proletariat makes a revolution, it will inevitably come, inevitably come into contradiction, into hostile contradiction with the peasants. The contradictions in the position of a workers' government in a backward country with an overwhelmingly peasant population could be solved only 
on an international scale in the arena of world proletarian revolution. So the Russian revolution cannot survive because the peasant classes of Russia are reactionary and it, the Russian revolution would only be able to survive if it was given help from the European revolution. Um, Trotsky continues, without direct state support from the European proletariat, the working class of Russia will not be able to maintain itself in power and to transform its temporary rule into a lasting socialist dictatorship. This we cannot doubt for an instant. Very, very clear, I think. Um, and then when socialist construction began to proceed, he wrote, we have not arrived or even begun to arrive at the creation of a socialist society. Real progress of a socialist economy in Russia will become possible only after the victory of the proletariat in the major European countries. So what, is the, what was the Russian proletariat supposed to do, given that in Europe the proletariat had not come to power, Trotsky writes, the Russian proletariat must, on its own initiative, carry the revolution onto European soil. The Russian revolution will throw itself against old capitalist Europe. Now, in this regard, in my view, Trotsky essentially becomes a highly Eurocentric uh, Marxist who thinks that any revolution that occurs outside of the context of Europe is bound to degenerate into a horrible Stalinist bureaucratic monstrosity in the absence of a European revolution which is the only thing that can save a revolution in a relatively backward society from certain ruin. And the reason for this ruin, again, is basically his characterization and understanding of the peasant question. Now, I don't think I need to emphasize that the history of the 20th century has shown that communists have not only managed to gain enormous support amongst the peasants, but that the, the, the essential sort of politics of the most of the left across the third world has been, you know, worker peasant alliance. And today that has become so central to the entire left, wherever it exists in the third world, that uh, Today, Trotskyists will no longer mention why Trotsky thought um, that the revolution in Russia would not be able to survive. Please understand this is the most crucial aspect. Trotsky did not think that the revolution in Russia could not survive because the economy was backward or any of these reasons. Rather, he felt that the backward economy created a class of people that was a majority which was not going to support socialism. The majority would not support socialism. That was the main reason, the majority being, of course, the peasant class. Now, quite independently of whether you consider Lenin to be right or Stalin to be right or Trotsky or some Plekhanov to be right, we can assess whether Trotsky's characterization of the peasant class as a reactionary or conservative class that would come into hostile collision with the proletariat uh, has been has uh, been proven true throughout the history of the 20th century. I think it has not. Whether we look at the revolutions in East Asia, whether we look at Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, China, uh, Korea, etc., or we look at you know the revolutionary movements in Indonesia, PKI, or Malaysia, etc., or we look at the peasant movements in South, a sorry, we look at the communist movements in South Asia, we look at uh, we look at communist support in India, etc., or we move all the way across the continent to Latin America, we have seen that communist organizations, groups, parties have not only managed to gain peasant support, but that in many countries they have greater peasant support than they have you know, in urban areas. A lot of times, for example, in West Bengal, the CPIM government got more votes from rural areas of Bengal than they did from urban areas of Bengal. So I don't think it's altogether correct for people to think that the, um, you know, that the peasant class would not support um, would not support a socialist government. When the combined might of Europe threw its weight under fascist leadership against the Soviet Union, did the peasant masses revolt against their own government or did they unite with their own government to fight against the German in, uh, and the fascist European-wide invasion? I think the answer is quite obvious. Uh, 
in the context of the Chinese revolution, there was a only, you know, a small group of proletarian revolutionaries. The vast majority of the Communist Party of China was composed of peasants uh, or of peasant origin. And yet they were, you know, managed not only to, to mobilize peasants in a massive peasant war, revolutionary war, but they also managed then to create a regime uh, which, uh, whatever our criticism of it may be, is proving to be remarkably stable uh, in the way that it operates. One can, of course, argue that the, the particular way in which the Chinese Revolution has developed in, in, in contrast to the Russian Revolution is also driven by uh, the preponderance of the peasant class in the Communist Party of China, but that's a separate debate altogether. So let's come back to Lenin for just a little bit. Lenin's concept was uh, uh, similar but also dissimilar to Trotsky. For example, on the one hand, Lenin and Trotsky agreed that they were not going to wait some long time for capitalist development before they were going to attempt to take power. So Lenin also stands for what he liked to call inter uninterrupted revolution. He says, from the democratic revolution, we shall at once and just in accordance with the measure of our strength, the strength of the class conscious and organized proletariat begin to pass to the socialist revolution. We stand for uninterrupted revolution. We shall not stop halfway. He continues, we shall put every effort into assisting the entire peasantry to carry out the democratic revolution in order thereby to make it easier for us, the party of the proletariat, to pass on as quickly as possible to the new and higher task, the socialist revolution. And to continue, uh, the Kautskys, Hilferdings, Martovs, Chernovs, Hilquits, uh, Longwits, McDonalds, and Turatis and other heroes of the two and a half Marxism were incapable of understanding the relation between the bourgeois democratic and proletariat socialist revolutions. The first grows into the second. The second, in passing, resolves the questions of the first. The second consolidates the work of the first. Struggle and struggle alone decides how far the second succeeds in outgrowing the first. In other words, we cannot determine this question beforehand. We can't say, oh, Pakistan is at this stage. We can only do this much with you know in, in 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 the way that in which Pakistan can be transformed no that's not what Lenin is arguing in fact he would rather that we do as much as possible and the extent to which you can you can move and change society Lenin is much more flexible here as a as a materialist examining society depends only on the class consciousness the degree of preparedness of the uh, of the party of the proletariat and you know and all these subjective objective factors combined <coughs> <coughs> Lenin thinks, <coughs> excuse me, Lenin continues, you know, after he made the, rev after Lenin made the revolution, he, he thinks that, uh, he writes that things worked out exactly as we said they would. He says, the course taken by the revolution has confirmed the correctness of our re reasoning. God, how many times Marxists love to repeat that particular phrase. <laughs> but anyway, first with the whole of the peasantry against the monarchy, against the landlords, against the medieval regime. And to that extent, the revolution remains bourgeois, bourgeois democratic. Then with the poor peasants, with the semi-proletariats, with all the exploited against capitalism, including the rural rich, the kulak, the profiteers, and to that extent, the revolution becomes a socialist one. To attempt to raise an artificial Chinese wall between the first and the second, to separate them by anything else than the degree of preparedness of the proletariat and the degree of its unity with the poor peasants means monstrously to distort Marxism, to vulgarize it, to substitute liberalism in its place, it means smuggling in a reactionary defense of the bourgeoisie against the socialist proletariat by means of quasi-scientific references to the progressive character of the bourgeoisie as compared with medievalism. I think nothing could be clearer than this, but I think, you know, let me explain what Lenin here means. So what Plekhanov and Lenin both argued right at the beginning, you know, right at the beginning of their of building the party, this is back in the 1890s, Lenin's famous book in 1898 was The Development of Capitalism in Russia, was that the Narodnik theory that Russia could skip over capitalism was absurd because Russia had already developed capitalism. It was already in the stage of capitalism. There was no question of skipping over it. They were already in it. And because Russia was already in the stage of capitalism, commodity production, private property, wage labor was spreading from urban areas into rural areas. And Lenin says that as uh, 
wage labor was spreading into rural areas, it was resulting in what he called the de-peasantization of the peasant class. The peasant class was becoming de-peasantized. It no longer was like a peasant class. In other words, the peasant class, Marxists often thought, was like a, hum, a bit of a homogenous sort of a, a class uh, that was not highly differentiated in its standard of living or in its wealth, etc., from each other. And all, they were all against the feudal lords, but within themselves there were no sharp class contradictions. But as capitalism penetrated into the countryside, the peasant class itself now begins to uh, uh, divide into different classes and those different classes were rich peasants, middle peasants, poor peasants, landless peasants. Rich peasants could you know hire labor, middle peasants could not necessarily hire labor but didn't necessarily need to hire labor, poor peasants were those who needed to hire labor, hire themselves out as labor and uh, the poorest of the poor, the landless peasants, the agricultural proletariat had of course no land and were you know, essentially agricultural proletariats. So this was the depeasantization process. And this depeasantization process meant that not only could the peasantry then now be mobilized, as was the case in the bourgeois democratic revolution, against the aristocracy, but that the peasantry now could also be mobilized. The poorer sections of the peasantry could now also be mobilized to undo private property itself. And insofar as agriculture would not slowly turn against private property, it would become more and more socialist. All right, so um, was uh, so finally, so from this, Lenin came to the very clear conclusion that um, socialism could survive in Russia on its own because the social foundation of the Bolshevik government rested on the one hand on the urban proletariat and on the other hand on a rural peasantry that was increasingly de-peasantized uh, and hence broken into classes um, and the, the Bolsheviks could find support and would find very permanent and very solid support among, especially amongst the poorer sections of the peasantry. And this was meant that the Bolshevik government would represent not just the tiny minority of proletariats, but would represent the vast majority uh, of the workers and peasants of Russia, thereby creating a stable socialist government. Was Trotsky aware of this theory? Yes, he was. And what did Trotsky write about this? Trotsky writes directly against Lenin and says the only more or less concrete historical arguments advanced against the slogan of a United States of Europe was formulated in the Swiss Social Democrat, which was at the time the central organ of the Bolsheviks, in the following sentence. Now he's reading Lenin's sentence, quoting it. Uneven economic and political development is an absolute law of capitalism, unquote. From this, the social democrat draws the conclusion that the victory of socialism is possible in one country and that therefore there is no reason to make the dictatorship of the proletariat in each separate country contingent upon the establishment of the United States of Europe. That capitalist development in different countries is uneven is an absolutely incontrovertible argument. Trotsky says, I agree with Lenin here. But this unevenness is itself extremely uneven, a very strange phrase, but anyway, the capitalist level of Britain, Australia, Germany, or France is not identical, but in comparison with Africa and Asia, all these countries represent capitalist Europe, which has grown ripe over the social revolution, that no country in its struggle must wait for others is an elementary thought, which is it which it is useful and necessary to reiterate in order that the idea of concurrent international action may not be replaced by the idea of temporizing international inaction, waiting uh, he explains what he means. He says, without waiting for the others, we begin and continue the struggle nationally in the full confidence that our initiative will give an impetus to the struggle in other countries. But if this should not occur, in other words, if Europe does not become socialist, it would be hopeless to think, as historical experience and theoretical considerations testify, that, for example, a revolutionary Russia could hold out in the face of a conservative Europe, or that a socialist Germany could exist in isolation in a capitalist world. So we see here that Trotsky always thought that you needed a European-wide revolution for socialism to survive, mainly because he thought, especially for Russia or other backward countries, because there was a vast class uh, of people, of peasants, that would be hostile to the, uh, to the uh, socialist government. But also you see from this quotation that he's well aware Trotsky is well aware that Lenin supports the idea of socialism in one country. Lenin attacks Trotsky's idea uh, that there should be a European-wide revolution by saying, uh, 
I know that there are of course sages who think that they are very clever and even call themselves socialists who assert that power should not have been seized until the revolution had broken out in all countries. They do not suspect that by speaking in this way they are deserting the revolution and going over to the side of the bourgeoisie to wait until the toiling classes bring about a revolution on an international scale means that everybody should stand um, stock still in expectation. That is nonsense. In other words, if you can construct a theory that the uh, a, a socialist revolution in the third world or in backward societies is inevitably going to fail in the absence of a worldwide revolution or at least a European wide revolution, then you are essentially relegating those people to a form of uh, um, uh, uh, quietism, a, a revo you know, sort of a, 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 a situation where they will not be able to take action, real action, because they are not assured any real victory, theoretically or otherwise. I found at the time when I was studying in the United States and later when I was also studying in uh, the United Kingdom that the revolutionary movement, the left in these countries is extremely, the Marxist left, the socialist left in these countries is extremely weak. These countries are nowhere near what we would consider to be a revolutionary situation. The governments of these countries, despite all the criticisms, is quite stable, right? Uh, their, their social systems are relatively much more stable than other social systems and governments of third world countries. And so, uh, you know, as a Pakistani and as somebody committed to sort of going back to my country and, uh, you know, helping uh, uh, workers and peasants in my own country, I put this question to, to all the Trotskyist organizations that I came across in the United States as well as in the United Kingdom uh, through the Internet and, and in person. I said, you know, if Pakistan makes a revolution or India makes a revolution and it doesn't occur in, the, in Europe, I can understand that this is a great argument for European workers or for American workers that the urgency, you know, you can convey the urgency of why a European revolution is necessary to European workers by saying, if you don't make a revolution, people in the third world are, you know, going to be stuck in imperialism and so on. I understand that urgency entirely. But on a larger historical, in a large, larger historical framework, don't we find it surprisingly Eurocentric that you know, a third world country that a theory states that that Asia, Africa, Latin America and other parts of the colonized world cannot emerge into a new social system, a new system of justice, again, without the assistance of the European uh, sort of enlightened uh, proletariat or whatnot, etc. Uh, I mean, this doesn't really fit in, in my view, with Marxism, where we've seen that certain parts of the world were far ahead of other parts of the world. For example, Asia was far ahead of Europe, um, you know, as in the, when, with the agricultural revolution, you know, we count the Middle East as part of Asia and, and China, India, etc. And then you had, you know, the Greco-Roman sort of slave society that advanced. And then after that, you had feudalism mainly based in France, etc. And then capitalism. So, you know, various parts of the world have taken the lead civilizationally, historically, at various different intervals. And Marx never suggests that, one, that you know, the initiative of history will always belong to one people or another people, etc. So this sort of seems to me a very strangely, a very deeply Eurocentric idea. And um, for any revolutionary from, uh, let's say, Pakistan, India, etc., it would imply that um, India or Pakistan or South Asia or whatever uh, third world country we are talking about lacks the capacity to liberate itself, number one, from imperialism, capitalism, colonialism, whatnot. Uh, and number two, even if it did liberate itself, um, it, that liberation would be temporary. It would soon degenerate into a bureaucratic, m dictatorial monstrosity. Uh, and uh, that it, uh, without, uh, you know, a, a worldwide revolution would be doomed. I think this is the main reason why Trotskyism has been such a spectacular spectacular failure amongst intellectuals in the third world. While it's been successful in, um, in certain first world countries, in your European countries, etc., because it's sort of, it is Eurocentric, it's been a spectacular failure all over the third world. This is the main reason. Uh, 
that um, you are essentially saying that any revolution that occurs in the third world will be not, it will inevitably be a Stalinist bureaucratic monstrosity. And Asia can never, Asian revolutionaries, uh, th revolutionaries from the third world can never on their own initiative liberate um, uh, their own uh, societies or countries or civilizations, etc., etc. I hope that uh, you will not interpret what I'm saying as being a Pakistani or a third world nationalist. That's not my intent at all. My intent is to suggest that a theory that precludes the very possibility that the locus of revolutionary world historic transformation can shift anywhere outside of Europe um, is, in my view, deeply problematic, not only because of its latent Eurocentricism, but more importantly because it rests on the incorrect assumption that the peasants are a reactionary class, um, that there is no de-peasantization, and that the peasantry, especially the poorer sections of the peasantry, cannot form a cohesive, stable basis for a socialist government in the third world, and that in the absence of a European-wide uh, revolution, all socialist revolutions are prone to some kind of horrible, bureaucratic, monstrous, dictatorial degeneration. That theory, I think, is the core reason why Trotskyism, although it remains popular in the West because of the urgency with which it addresses European and Western workers to make the revolution in order to, you know, to undo imperialism, etc., has utterly failed in the rest of the third, third world, in the rest of the world, in fact, in Africa and Latin America, in Asia, etc., because of its, because it, it is a dead end to our people who are working, let's say, in Pakistan or India, uh, because they suggest that whatever our actions, uh, they will always be temporary, incomplete. We cannot actually build socialism. We cannot have a stable government, say, a stable socialist government in the absence of a worldwide socialist revolution. So I think, um, and, and the foundation of, of, and as I've already said, the foundation of this is that the peasantry is reactionary. So this entire theory, I think is one that I cannot accept. And uh, when I was uh, a college student in the United States, uh, the more I read about, um, the more I read the theory of the permanent revolution and began to realize that the entire edifice uh, was constructed on the faulty foundation that the peasants were essentially reactionary and therefore could not form a, could not provide a stable basis for a socialist government in the third world. Uh, I rejected Trotskyism on those grounds. And then I, of course, began to discover that there were many, many other, even more problematic aspects of Trotskyism. But that's for another video. Thank you so much.